even if you're running Docker, if you're running Kubernetes pods, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you have a big ass machine, which you're just running commands, which processes are just running on. You just have to find a smart way to be able to decouple them so that they think that they're running on different things. The title of the talk originally was Fortifying Container Runtime and Security on Kubernetes. And you might see that it's been slashed out. Uh, that's because uh, while writing the talk, I, I kind of wanted to talk about something else, but related in the same domain. So who's me? I'm uh, Vishesh, also known by my teammates as Vinish. Vinesh, Vinesh, uh, because a lot of people butcher it. Uh, I am a Wim philanthropist. Uh, this is written in Wim uh, and an evangelist. And I am a part-time infrastructure engineer at DeepSource. So we're primarily going to be talking about uh, containers and what they are and how they work. Uh, if somebody has seen this talk already, uh, the multiple iterations of it, I am sorry. But I'm sure you're going to come away with something that's uh, you know fun and learning from it. So let's do an audience poll. How many of us use containers daily? All of us, right? I would be very, how, much, how many of us don't? <laughs> audience participation. Uh, what do you guys use uh, instead? Oh, OK, that's fine as well. But you use containers for testing stuff out in development, right? Perfect. How, ma how many of us use, have used Docker for uh, managing any of our containers? All of us, right? That's, that's where we start from. And how many of us have messed, up with, messed around with Kubernetes? Most of us, right? It's the new big hot thing. So Docker, in, in uh, specific terms, is a container engine. So a container engine is, think of it as a framework that allows you to manage the life cycle, the state, and you know the configuration of your Docker and images, like standard images. It builds images primarily using Docker files. Now, Docker files are compliant to the OCI standard, and Docker internally uses it with BuildKit. So you have Docker, you run Docker build, and it will run the actual command that will, uh, it'll use BuildKit internally to take that spec that you've written in the Docker file, and then make a OCI compliant image of it. So it doesn't act, when you say Docker runs something, Docker necessarily doesn't run anything. The container runtime runs the thing. Uh, there's multiple container runtimes. The most popular one is Run C. Run C was introduced by the original Docker team and contributed to uh, the OCI spec and is now the standard default. So container images, what are they? They are basically just tarballs. They're just a stack of tarballs that you place one over the other, the other over the other, and you have a container image. There's a lot of just, uh, you get confused because you're pulling something, you're pushing something, there's SHA hashes, all of that. It's not really anything but just folders. Uh, that are stacked together with each other, uh, and that's about it. So it beckons the question, how do we go from folders to running something? Let's, think, uh, let, let's see. So what we'll do uh, is we'll grab ourselves an image. So I have a server running uh, where I have a root FS image. So who can tell me what a root FS image is? So what it is, is uh, if we go on to Firefox, uh, if we go and search and look it up, it is basically a POSIX compliant directory structure uh, that is, uh, POSIX is a standard which Unix adheres to. So it is basically a, a number of files and folders that are just stuck into a file system. So let's, uh, let's untar that. Give it just a little bit and it'll all extract out. OK, so uh, we have a root FS folder that spawned up. I don't know if this has tree, but we can just uh, ls into uh, root FS, sorry, cd into root FS. This looks familiar, right? This is something that we've seen if we have used Linux, right? It sounds and seems kind of like the Linux file system, right? 
if I go and open up a separate terminal and I cd into slash and I do a ls-la, there's a lot of files that are common, right? Even if it's a Mac OS compliant thing, which is BSD specific. So we have a folder structure of sorts where you have multiple files. So what can we do with this? We want something that's running, right? A container runtime runs something, right? So what we do is, we do some Linux magic. So the first step would be to restrict the view of the file system. So uh, as rightly pointed out, we'll be using a command called cheroot. So what we'll do is, we'll run this command, and you can see the prompt has changed, right? The reason why the prompt has changed is because the root folder that's visible to this process has changed. How we can confirm that is let's create a folder here. Uh, folder, maybe. The folder is visible here, right? Let's now run the cheroot command. There's no folder there, right? We've executed into a bin bash prompt inside the root fs folder. And if we do a sla l slash, we're still gonna stay here, right? So what does this give us? It gives us file system isolation. What file system isolation means is that this process cannot now talk to other files on the host file system. Because at the end of the day, may, even if you're running Docker, if you're running Kubernetes pods, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you have a big ass machine, which you're just running commands, which processes are just running on. You just have to find a smart way to be able to decouple them so that they think that they're running on different things. So uh, why does this work? We don't have access to the root file system, uh, the host file system. How are we able to kind of run the command, say slash bin slash bash? Anybody? We ran this command, right? This one. Why are we able to run slash bin slash bash if it doesn't have access to the host uh, system slash bin slash bash? Uh, so you're bundling these binaries inside the root fs folder. So if you take a look at bin, you see the standard uh, binaries that you see in any other file system. At the end of the day, Linux is just about files, folders, and good management of them. So uh, where do we go from there? So let's, uh, let's do a small activity. Uh, let's uh, run tmux and let's split it into two pins. The top will be where will be the host file system. The bottom will be where will be the root fs. Let's uh, cheroot into the uh, one of the terminals. So now uh, at the top is where we're running the host and at the bottom is where we're running the cherooted process, right? So we know that the file system of the host is not accessible to the uh, cherooted process. But what is accessible, uh, we can check, is say we uh, run something like top on the host process. Will this be visible to the child process? Yes. So we can confirm that. Uh, we'll have to though mount the proc file system. So we'll have to mount a small proc version to it, which is already here. So we're just mounting this to be used as the proc file system. Proc files, pro, uh, the proc folder is where all of your process information lies. You're gonna mount that, and then we can run ps aux grep i top. And look at that. We're able to see the process that is running in the host. Doesn't give you too much containerization now, does it? Like, it's available right here. Let's go a step ahead and then we can just p-kill uh, that top command and boom. The host has now been killed. The process is gone. The top process is gone. Now this is a problem because even just file system isolation isn't getting you anywhere. You need process level isolation. So what you're gonna do is we need some way of uh, isolating the process tree that the host process has from the child process. So we use namespaces. So you can create and enter namespaces. 
namespaces are a Linux concept which allows you to restrict access for a specific process to network interfaces, mount points, and most importantly, process trees. And for this, we use the unshare command. The unshare command is very simple here. We're running unshare, we're mounting a proc file system for slash proc, and then we are entering into it. Let's try running this command and see what we get. Let's hope that doesn't bundle the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, we have to get out of the actual rootfs because it's running the rootfs manually. So, again, let's go from the top. Both are currently running the host uh, file system. Uh, we're gonna now, instead of just cherooting in, we're gonna create a namespace first and then cheroot into it. Okay, same story as before. Let's try running top here, and let's see if uh, it's visible at the bottom. So you do psaux, and you uh, let's just see what the process tree looks like first. And something has changed. It finds itself as the PID one process instead of having access to the entirety of the host process. So it doesn't have any more visibility on the process tree. Cool. We have process isolation. Is that enough? So what uh, other process can do is that they can just go ahead, keep allocating memory, and then after a certain point, allocate as much memory in the entire system as is available, hog it all to themselves, and then you can't do anything. It's not a direct uh, attack on your host process, but it's basically that. You can't do anything on it. You can also join the namespace from a host process. So what you can do, so that's the whole idea behind namespaces. Linux namespaces are very elastic. You can use them in a multitude of ways. What you can do is uh, you can run this command on the host file system. And we can see that there's a lot of uh, root uh, FS uh, things, processes that are running. These are just multiple because I've been running it uh, just for testing purposes. What we can do is we can look at the namespace. Now we'll find the namespace. Anything process related, you can always think slash proc. So what we'll get is we'll get uh, the PID of a specific process and we'll CD into the proc namespace so the, the, the folder. There's a lot of folders here, right? So let's CD into look for uh, our own. I'll have to do a sudo, I think. Sudo. Okay. We have multiple folders here, right? And these folders uh, have a lot of different information about the respective process. You can see status, you can see syscalls, you can see timers. These are all the things that were taught to us in the, you know, computer internals. Uh, course in college, but uh, we never actually, I actually, at, actually at least never had the chance to pay attention to it, but after only looking at it, was I able to understand what's going on. So there's also a folder here called NS. That's where you have the namespace information. And uh, we can check the PIDs. Uh, we can cat the PIDs. Uh, oh. What is it? Oh yeah. So we have a single PID for that namespace. So what you can do is you can use this command to enter the namespace, and then you can join it as a separate process. A lot of times when you exec into something, this is how you kind of go about doing it. So you can also use C groups. As I was talking about memory restrictions, C groups allow you to uh, impose memory restric restrictions on processes. So while we're in the, uh, in the namespace, uh, you can have a look at, uh, we'll have to go into sysfsc group. This part I haven't tested out. Oh, there, there it is. Mm -hmm. 
I am not sure oh, where that lies. But regardless what you can do, let's just open up C groups man page. Yeah. So C groups allow you to con uh, control and uh, uh, impose limits on things like uh, processes, about memory, about CPU restrictions. So you can set a restriction on a process for say, to use 100 uh, MB of memory, and it, uh, if it goes past it, then uh, it'll automatically be killed. So why the long way around, right? Why all this chat about understanding what containers are briefly? Because there's a lot of different things that you can delve into with this. Docker is not, if it was as simple as doing this, anybody could have written Docker, right? It's not just that. Docker at attaches and allows you to do a multitude of different things. Uh, like networking, you know, like connecting those network interfaces together, uh, having virtual network interfaces. You know, Docker Swarms, when they were a thing, had a lot of different uh, you know, features that they'd added to this. But it's important to understand that at any level, all that's happening at the bottom is just Linux. And uh, you're just being given syntactic sugar around it to be able to do things like security, to be able to do things like availability, all of that. The point of telling this in the context of security is to understand that uh, the tools that you're going to be using are going to be in many ways making use of these small uh, Linux commands at the end of the day. So you thought there was a talk about container security, right? Let's go and look at the docs. If this will actually let me. No. Oh, I have it open. So this is the primary uh, security context documentation for Kubernetes. And a lot of things will make sense to you now if you go and look at these things in the context of understanding how Linux works internally. So help me, uh, so, so a quick question. Can I do the same thing that I did inside a Docker container? We learned about Docker and this is how things are made. We're like, cool, let's do cherooting, let's create a new namespace, let's ensure that our container is as hardened as possible. But what that means is, to run these commands, you need some sort of privileges and capabilities. Linux calls them Linux capabilities. So what Linux capabilities are, is that for any process, you have to assign them capabilities for it to be able to run system calls. So NSenter, for example, runs a system call. If you don't have access of permission via the Linux capabilities for it, then you won't be able to run NS Enter. So in the context of Docker, if you want to be able to do the same thing that we've done, which is cheroot into a separate process, create a new namespace, and then enter that namespace, you would have to give a cap sys admin to the respective uh, Docker container. Only then will it be able to run the syscall. Uh, can tell me, uh, someone uh, tell me why this is needed? At the end of the day, what's happening is that you're running system calls, right? So system calls have to traverse user, uh, user section into the kernel section. No matter what kind of a software you're running, it's at the end of the day kind of like an API, right? There's isolation, sure. But if you're running NS Enter, it has to make use of the kernel and what the, the facilities it provides to be able to run the command. So, the host file system needs to give access to the process that you have capsys admin and that you can run these commands internally. Only then will you be able to do the isolation at a container level inside things like Kubernetes. But that is scary because you're giving capsys admin comes with a lot of different privileges. So capsys admin is actually not recommended in general to be provided because it has way too many privileges, yeah. So this capability is overloaded because it provides almost access to run whatever you want. So in any case, if your container gets, you know, compromised and it has capsys admin, then it would mean that your node is compromised. And if your node is compromised, then your API server is compromised or your control plane is compromised. And if that is compromised, bye-bye Kubernetes. So that is one bit of how you can do it uh, in Kubernetes. You can set, uh, you, can, you have to enable privileged for the respective container
for it to be able to do any of these shenanigans. And then you need to provide Linux capabilities to be able to securely run those things. More things uh, are about SE Linux, App Armor, and Secom. Like these are various ways of securing uh, your processes and your containers. I won't go into them in, in, in a lot of detail because they are talks in their own time. But the point I wanted to uh, get across was that as comp, if you touch these without any context of how things work internally, you will be just in the middle of nowhere because you don't understand what's happening. At the end of the day, once you understand at a basic, simple level how containers work, only then will you be able to kind of use these to your own advantage. So please have a, a look at the manual. Uh, of course, uh, sorry for that. But uh, yeah, you, can, you have a multitude of different ways uh, to be able to run and secure your containers with these things. They come with their own problems and their own gotchas. But uh, yeah, please have a look. Uh, finally, uh, runtime security. Uh, Kubernetes has something very popular that's used for runtime security, which is Falco. Has somebody used Falco? So the same way that you use, uh, not that guy, not the thing. Uh, so Falco is a Kubernetes threat detection engine is what they call it. But it uses eBPF uh, in the backend. Uh, what it does is, is, in the same way that you have Tribi or you have SNCC for statically analyzing your container binaries, Falco will run as a daemon set on your uh, Kubernetes engine and it will check all pods for the system calls that are being made. And you can set it to alert. Uh, say a system call is made that you uh, that uh, is uh, requesting elevated access. You know, it will be able to tell you that things are happening inside your containers that are not expected. So Falco is the standard and de facto way of managing uh, container runtime on Kubernetes. Please have a look at that as well. It is, again, a talk in itself. But yeah, that's about it. If there's nothing else, uh, I, I, I'll sign off. All right. Thank you, folks.